As we discussed in the video on the rocky early years of the high school, it was difficult in the 19th century to even figure out what a high school was. In this video, we'll talk about how the institution of the high school, this thing we think of as the comprehensive high school, was firmed up during this period from 1890 to 1920. And there are three major trends that we are going to highlight. The first of this was the changes that were going on in the economy, the stuff that we refer to writ large as industrial capitalism. Second, we'll take a look at a few really important non-governmental bodies that were crucial to the standardization process. And finally, we'll consider a few state laws that helped make high school something that most people in America were starting to attend. Now, the first thing that really firmed up the high school during this period were the changes in the economy. That's a major trend that we have to make sure we understand. This is the period from 1890 to 1920, often called the Progressive Era, but it's also the time of the Second Industrial Revolution, when it's really going full tilt. We have fossil fuels that are being discovered, uncovered, moved around the country on railroads. We have these fossil fuels that are going into the making of electricity that's helping to produce steel and farm equipment. Farm production is skyrocketing. People are moving off the farms because their labor is no longer necessary there. People are pouring into cities. Urbanization is massively underway. We have new technologies like the telegraph and the telephone. And of course, railroads have been put down across the nation in a uh, form of state building that has been going on, reaching back into the Civil War era that has interconnected this entire national economy. This all together, we should think of as industrial capitalism. And my handwriting is awful. But beyond that point, what you should take away from this when it comes to schools is that this massive set of changes in the economy unleashed demand for a high school education that had not been there in the same way before. America's cities were growing denser and denser, people moving off the farms, but also people immigrating to the United States. Many of them from Europe, many more would have come from other countries if it hadn't been for some racially targeted laws like the Chinese Exclusion Act. There was a new need with all of these new trusts and corporations to have the sort of skills that were being taught in the high school, the reading, the writing, arithmetic, being able to understand how all these goods should move around. There was a huge demand for middle management positions in those corporations and trusts. And increasingly, people who once upon a time might have been artisans or farmers were finding that they wanted their children to have the tools to be able to move up in this world, and that required the sort of education one might get in the high school. But changes in demand are not the whole story of how high schools were firmed up into the institution that we know, love, and revile today. In order to understand that, we really have to take a look at these private regulatory bodies that really firmed up the institution. Now, of these non-governmental organizations or NGOs that were particularly important when it comes to the high school, one of the first we need to consider is the NEA, the National Education Association. Now, the NEA is still around today, and it's an organization sprang up and really firmed up in the 1880s as a body that tried to coordinate a lot of state education associations at this sort of national level. And it was at the NEA where you had massive battles over what the curriculum of schools should be like, what should be the focus and organization of these schools. And this is where you had several major reports that education historians have tracked that helped figure out what the high school should be, could be, and would be. Now, two reports in particular stand out that came from the NEA that helped show the transition that's going on with the high school. First of all, in 1893, the Committee of Ten on Secondary Studies issues a report that says that the curriculum of the high school should be the same for all students. And education historians, by and large, have interpreted this as something that helped keep high school to be something that would only be for people going to college. But over the next 20 years, there were many, many battles about what high school should be, resulting finally in the 1918 report called the Cardinal Principles of Education. And this came from another body, another committee in the NEA that was looking at the purpose of secondary schools. This report helped broaden the purpose of what a high school should be, and it included principles like health and vocation, in addition to the sort of things that would make you uh, excel in colleges during that period. 
No longer did you just have to master Greek and Latin and Babylonian history. Instead, the curriculum, as articulated in that 1918 Cardinal Principles Report, could expand to include things like home economics, shop class, civics, those sorts of classes. Now, the NEA was not the only important body when it came to standardizing the high school. Really important here were the regional associations of schools and colleges. And these sprang up somewhat organically, but many of them kind of copying each other in the Midwest, in the Northeast, in the South, in the Mid-Atlantic. And what these organizations were trying to do was trying to figure out what was the connection between high school and college. Did you really have to take Greek in order to go to college? How could we judge science facilities when it came to both high schools and colleges? And furthermore, what even was a high school or a college? It's these regional associations starting in the late 19th century, moving into the early 20th century, that start figuring these questions out. And this is where we get things like college entrance exams. This is where we get the system of accreditation whereby a group of educators go out and stamp schools as accredited or not accredited based on things like the number of library books they have, the student to teacher uh, ratios, um, these sorts of ways of judging whether high schools met the bill. And gradually, what is the work of these private bodies becomes codified into many state laws. Uh, but to understand how those state laws were put into place, we have to understand the work that was being done by these regional accreditors. Now, these weren't the only important private organizations during this period. We also have to look at several philanthropic organizations that were highly influential when it came to standardizing the high school. For instance, the Carnegie Foundation gave us the Carnegie Unit in 1906, this way of dividing up the time that is spent, what it is that you get as a credit. These units are what you're able to accrue to get a diploma, and eventually it all gets worked into the other systems of standardizing the school. Also important, the General Education Board, this was funded by Rockefeller money. So between the two of these, two of the biggest corporations in the United States, two of these biggest trusts uh, are helping fund what's going on. Together, these private bodies thrashed out the basic elements of what it would mean to get a high school education. Now, the private sphere was very, very important during this period, but it wasn't everything. What about federal law, you might ask? Did the federal government help shape the school system? The answer, uh, in some ways, but for the most part, no. The Office of Education, we don't have a Department of Education at all at that point. The Office of Education is really little more than a body that is there to help distribute information. It doesn't do much regulating of what the school system is. Uh, rather, it just helps disseminate information about what it could be. Now, state law, on the other hand, was massively important. This is where a lot of the action was when it came to laws that were being passed. And to understand why more people started going to high school, we also have to understand two laws in particular, two major trends in laws that are happening, kind of uh, domino effect across the states. One of these was the series of child labor laws that's being passed during the Progressive Era. These are the laws that are restricted, restricting what age you can be when you're going out to work. Remember, during the, uh, this era of industrialization, we have people as young as 8, 9, 10 out working in textile mills, in factories across the United States. Child labor laws are banning that. Now, compulsory education laws have been on the books, many of them just after the Civil War, but they start getting greater enforcement during this period uh, of the early 1900s. And they really go hand in hand. The, more or less the same group of people who are promoting child labor laws are also promoting compulsory education laws and greater enforcement of those laws. And so these are going hand in hand building up the number of people attending school, both at the common school, elementary school level, and also increasingly during this period at the secondary school level. Now, by and large, state courts were supportive of these coercive new laws that were being passed. For instance, in Georgia, the state Supreme Court in 1918 upheld an expulsion of a girl from school in a district because she attended a movie on a weeknight, something that was forbidden by the school board. 
That was ruled to be an acceptable use of state power. Now, there's a lot more we could unpack about the standardization of the high school during this period, and if you're interested, I hope you'll read some of the great books that have been written on the topic. But at the most basic level, I want you to take away that these three trends were highly influential in standardizing the high school. One, the changes in the economy that increased the demand for a high school education. Two, these private regulatory bodies that really standardized and firmed up and defined what the institution was. And three, these state laws that coerced more people into attending high school and restricted child labor so that fewer people would work in these factories. Now, on the topic of factories, there's a lot more to understand in particular about the rise of industrial capitalism and the changes in the economy and how that changes the needs of education and a new workforce. That's something we'll take up in the next video.